In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, living in Mary, come be with us as we meditate on the crucifixion and death of our Lord Jesus. Help us penetrate these mysteries. Help us uh, take Mary as our guide so that we can love with her heart, understand with her mind, and penetrate the depths of Jesus' love in a far greater way than we could ever do on our own. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We've already talked about the seven last words of Christ, so we won't... Um, this is kind of an overview rather than a detailed look at the crucifixion, an overview to just look at the depth of God's love for us. Dear brothers and sisters, let us look at Christ pierced in the cross. He is the unsurpassing revelation of God's love. On the cross, it is God himself who begs the love of his creature. He is thirsty for the love of every one of us. In the pierced heart of the crucified, God's own heart is opened up. Here we see who God is and what he is like. Heaven is no longer locked up. God has stepped out of his hiddenness. That reminds me of the scripture for today, the first week of Advent Thursday. It talks about um, this song. In the land of Judah, on that day they will sing this song. Isaiah 26. Open up the gates to let in a nation that is just, one that keeps faith, a nation of firm purpose you keep in peace, in peace for its trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is an eternal rock. He humbles those in high places. In the lofty city he brings down, he tumbles it to the ground, levels it with dust. It is trampled underfoot by the needy, by the footsteps of the poor. But our Lord opens the gate. He himself is the gate. And with his death on the cross, he opens up heaven for us. In the psalm, it's 118, Open to me the gates of justice. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. The gate is the Lord's. The just shall enter it. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and have been my Savior. O Lord, grant salvation. O Lord, grant prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. The Lord has opened his heart so that we can enter heaven through this mystery and he not only has opened heaven for us but he has justified us through his blood oh what wondrous love is god does god have for us for each one of us the crucifix does not signify defeat or failure. It reveals to us the love that overcomes evil and sin. Christ conquered the devil using the same weapons that the devil used against us, a virgin, a tree, and death. These tokens of our demise have now become tokens of our victory. Instead of Eve, there was Mary. Instead of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the wood of the cross, instead of Adam's death, the death of Christ. So again, we ask Mary to be with us, for she loves us tenderly, more tenderly than all the mothers in the whole world. And we surrender ourselves to her so that she can fill us with herself.
Fulton Sheen writes, What is sin? Sin is separation from God and an alienation from love. But Mary lost God too. She lost him not morally but physically. During those seemingly, seemingly endless three days when her divine son was only 12 years of age, searching, questioning, knocking from door to door, pleading and begging, Mary came to know something of the despairing emptiness of those who have not yet found Christ. This was the moment of her widowhood of the soul, when Mary came to know how every sinner feels, not because she sinned, but because she felt the effect of sin, namely the loss of God and the loneliness of the soul. To every soul who is lost, she can truly address the same words, Son, we have sought thee sorrowing. Jesus tells St. Faustina, Your misery does not hinder my mercy, my daughter. Write that the greater misery of a soul, the greater its right to my mercy. Urge all souls to trust in the unfathomable abyss of my mercy, because I want to save them all. On the cross, the fountain of my mercy was opened wide by the lance for all souls. No one have I excluded. Oh, how sorely Jesus is hurt by the ingratitude of a chosen soul. What a martyrdom it is for his unspeakable love. God loves us with the entire infinite being that he is. And imagine a miserable particle of dust scorns that love. My heart bursts with pain when I see this ingratitude. This is, um, again, from the diary of St. Faustina. Jesus tells her again, If my death on the cross does not convince you of my love, what will convince you? I've spoken before, but Jesus revealed to St. Faustina the greatest suffering that he has is when we don't trust him. When we don't trust in his love and his mercy. And so that's why we go to Mary for help, because she can help us. She can give us her mind and her heart so we can trust in God's mercy. We can abandon ourselves to God through her. O oh Lord, forgive us for our mistrust and for our lack of faith. O oh Lord, help us believe. It was not death but love that saved us. The love of God reached human beings at the farthest point to which they were driven in their flight from him death itself. The death of Christ needed to demonstrate to everyone the supreme proof of God's mercy towards sinners. That is why his death does not even have the dignity of a certain privacy, but is framed between the death of two thieves. He wants to remain a friend to sinners right up to the end, so he dies like them and with them. Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. These words might well sum up the mystery of the Christian faith. Mercy has become living and visible in Jesus of Nazareth, reaching its culmination in him. So often we have a mistaken view of God, a mistaken view of his of his being, of his essence. So this consecration is meant to um, purify our thoughts and our minds and our hearts um, to help us understand more deeply who God is, a God that we can trust, a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's who God revealed himself as in Exodus when he revealed who he was to Moses. 
So often we get confused and we think of God as a tyrant or vicious or um, condemning. Those are not um, accurate descriptions of God. That is why Jesus came and he talked about him being the revelation of the Father. He said, when you see me, you see the Father. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in him everything he might have the supremacy for god was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross if we ever doubt who god is we only have to look at a crucifix to pick it up and to gaze on the crucifix to understand more about who God is. If we ever doubt his faithfulness or his mercy. This is again through St. Faustina. Today I entered into the bitterness of the passion of the Lord Jesus. I suffered in a purely spiritual way. I learned how horrible sin was. God gave me to know the whole hideousness of sin. I learned in the depth of my soul how horrible sin was, even the smallest sin, and how much it tormented the soul of Jesus. I would rather suffer a thousand hells than commit even the smallest venial sin. It wasn't without reason that Jesus died on the cross for us to atone for our sins. May this awareness help us to, to choose to rid ourselves of sin, to again choose God over and above sin. That which is wrong, the reality of evil, cannot simply be ignored. It cannot just be left to stand. It must be dealt with. It must be overcome. Only this counts as a true mercy. And the fact that God now confronts evil himself because men are incapable of doing so, therein lies the unconditional goodness of God. Sin has to be atoned for. It has to be... Um, It has to be dealt with, as, Saint, as Pope Benedict says. It can't be ignored. And so Jesus came to make things new. If we wish to understand the power of Christ's blood, we should go back to the ancient account of its prefiguration in Egypt. Sacrifice a lamb without blemish, commanded Moses, and sprinkle its blood on your doors. The saving power lies not in the blood itself, but in the fact that it is a sign of the Lord's blood. In those days, when the destroying angel saw the blood on the doors, he did not dare to enter. So how much less will the devil approach now when he sees not that figurative blood on the doors, but the true blood? on the lips of the believers, the doors of the temple of Christ. The soldier pierced the Lord's side. He breached the wall of the sacred temple, and I have found the treasure and made it my own. So also with the lamb, the Jews sacrificed the victim, and I have been saved by it. These two last quotes were from St. John Chrysostom. 
oh, what unfathomable depths we could um, ponder with Jesus' crucifixion. What glorious freedom he has bought for us. He has made straight a path through the sea of sin and death. He is leading us to the true promised land, the eternal promised land, a promised land of uh, eternal life and love beyond all telling. I has not seen, ear conceived, mind could understand what awaits us in heaven. Keep your eyes on the crucifix, for Jesus without the cross is a man without a mission, and the cross without Jesus is a burden without a reliever. Jesus came to save. He came to be our Savior. This was his mission. He chose this. It wasn't chosen and um, put upon him. He fr freely chose this. He freely chose to be nailed to the cross. So to nail our sins um, to the cross. So they would have no more power over us. He freely chose to be crucified so we could be crucified to our sins. Our sins could be crucified and no longer have power over us. Fulton Sheen writes about the crucifixion. Once nailed to the cross and lifted up to draw all, all men to himself, Jesus is taunted. Others he saved, himself he cannot save. Of course not. This is not weakness, but obedience to the law of sacrifice. A mother cannot save herself if she would raise her child. The rain cannot save itself if it would bud the greenery. A soldier cannot save himself if he would save his country. And neither will Christ save himself, since he came to save us. What heart can conceive the misery of humankind? If the Son of God had saved himself from suffering and left a fallen world to the wrath of God. Remember, God knows what suffering feels like. I wanted to share an experience with you. Um, one that I had several years ago when I was praying the Stations of the Cross in an empty church. I was um, overwhelmed with the depth of my sinfulness. And so during each station, I begged Jesus to forgive me for my sin and my failures. And I, I liked to pray the Stations of the Cross while also meditating on the Seven Sorrows of Mary. I found that when I go to and um, meditate on the passion of Jesus, if I meditate on it with Mary, it, um, it penetrates my heart so much more deeply. She helps me. And so I was praying with Mary her sorrows from first having her son's future prophesied by Simeon in the temple, when he was just a babe, when he foretold that he would be a sign that would be contradicted and that Mary's heart would be pierced. And unto meeting, uh, Mary meeting Jesus as he carried his cross, and then receiving her dead son again in her arms, the sorrow juxtaposes Jesus asleep in her arms as a perfectly formed newborn wrapped in swaddling clothes who the father sent to us in the arms of his mother to that perfect man now broken bloodied and marred beyond recognition the man of sorrows whom Mary received once more in her lap as she offers him back to the father 
And I thought, what have we done to him through our sinfulness? And so as I meditated and relived the passion of Jesus, I imagined the great suffering he was was enduring, and I contemplate Jesus, contemplated him receiving blows and scourges and vehement insults and blasphemies. I contemplated him being crucified. But as I was contemplating this, an amazing realization came to me. It was that Jesus never for a moment or even for a fraction of a moment, not even for a split second, felt angry or vengeful toward his attackers. The Holy Spirit inspired me with the realization that Jesus, as love enfleshed, never felt even a moment of anger or hatred toward those who were harming him. Even as they were whipping him, even as they tore his flesh off his body, or nailed him to the cross, or insulted or spit upon him, for he was not only their creator, but their redeemer. As a man, he endured such cruelty and felt every physical and emotional blow. And yet, as God, as love himself, he cannot not love, for God is love. And so even as he was being abused, he loved his attackers. And I realized he forgave me immeasurably, completely, forgiving me and all his people whom he created out of love, even as they abused, mocked, ridiculed, and blasphemed him, even while they were still sinning against him. To understand and see his love in his eyes looking at me. And that it was only and always love. It was never condemnation. It was just love and mercy. It just overpowered me with emotion. Emotion that moved me to sob to the deepest core of my being. I sobbed deeply. And for a long, long, long time, as I came to understand in it, in a more deeper, intimate way, how much Jesus loves me. Even in my worst sinfulness. doesn't hate me for even a moment he looks at me and he looks at all of his attackers only with love and compassion and forgiveness which he articulates in his first word spoken from the cross father forgive them for they know not what they do i can't tell you how much healing this realization has brought to me how often I have meditated on it, and how often I have wept in gratitude for God's limitless forgiveness and mercy that alone can transform us. I pray we stop and ponder the weight of our sinfulness and the passion that Jesus endured to save us and set us free from sin and death in order to set us free from sin and death, as well as the overwhelming love and compassion Jesus has for each of us while we are in sin and are in our frailty. He doesn't take our sin lightly, for we see the horrible wages of sin and the passion and death that Jesus endured for us. Yet, in and through his passion, we are set free by his loving mercy which transforms our lives when we truly recognize in all humility the cost of our sinfulness, coupled with the love that is beyond all telling, that has taken all our just punishments. Jesus has taken my just punishment on himself, each of ours. The cross is truly the point where injustice and peace kiss and truth and love meet as Jesus bears our burdens 
and sin and sins in order to transform us by and through and in love in order to make us children of God, heirs of the kingdom, who are crucified to sin and death and live again in Christ Jesus, redeemed and overcome by God's compassionate forgiveness. May we be moved by the love of God for us in an ever deeper transforming way. Oh, how beautiful it is to stand before the crucifix, simply to be under the Lord's gaze so full of love. May these meditations pierce our hearts. May we truly come to know God's loving forgiveness. May you see his eyes look at you. filled with love and tenderness and, and may his love empower us each one of us to choose him over sin and to ba abandon ourselves to him to give ourselves fully to him in response to all he has given to us he has emptied himself taking the form of a slave may we give ourselves back to him through Mary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.